the sun. Brilliant, powerful, giver of life. But this is the story of how the sun will one day become our enemy. If we are to survive, we'll have to leave the Earth. We'll need to seek out new homes and amazing new places. And change other worlds to recreate the Earth we left behind. In the far future, our sun will become a monster. It will burn all life from our planet, destroy entire worlds. And finally, our sun will even destroy itself. It's going to happen. One day our sun will die, and when it does, we'll go with it. It's time to think about the future. For five billion years, the sun has nourished the Earth. It is the sun that provides the energy for plants to grow. It is the sun that makes life on Earth possible. But that will change. Slowly, unstoppably, our sun is getting hotter and hotter. Once it gave life to us all, but what it gave, it can also take away. If human beings are to have a long-term future, we must leave our planet behind and search for new places to live. One day, our homes will be out there, somewhere in space. In the distant future, this could be our home. Out here in space, we'll have to seek refuge on new worlds where we could settle and live. And the reason is, we have to escape from our sun. Some new worlds may be difficult to adapt to. Others may be very like our own. But what is it that makes our planet so special? And why is it so dependent on the sun? Here is the sun as it is today. In the center of our solar system. The Earth goes round it about there. There are the other planets. The reason why our planet is the one with life on it is that it is just the right distance from the sun. Closer in, and we'd boil. Further out, and we'd freeze. We live in a kind of safe zone that's perfect for life. The trouble is, that zone is moving. The sun is getting hotter, and as it does, the region where life can exist shifts further and further out. Ultimately, the safe zone will leave Earth behind. When it does, we'll be in serious trouble. Our planet will die.
This is how it will happen. As the sun burns up its nuclear energy, it will become hotter and hotter. By the time it's 5% hotter, plant life everywhere will be dying. Ten percent hotter, and animals too will begin to die. Fifteen percent hotter, rivers and oceans will evaporate, creating huge cloud banks, trapping more and more heat. In the far future, life on Earth will become impossible, and there's nothing we can do about it. What will happen to us then? Astronautical engineer Robert Zubrin believes he has the answer. He wants to find us a new place to live. The uh, only real choice that we have is to uh, grow, expand, become a spacefaring civilization, or to become extinct. Not only would we become extinct, but unless we become a spacefaring civilization and bring Earth life out with us into the universe, all life on Earth will become extinct. Robert Zubrin's goal is to make us a home on Mars. Today, Mars is cold and lifeless. Temperatures regularly drop to 100 below freezing and its atmosphere is 200 times thinner than our own. A person standing unprotected on the surface of Mars would be dead in seconds. Yet some scientists believe we could still learn to call this home. Mars is the only other planet in our solar system that has on it all the resources needed to support life. It has water. It's frozen to the surface as ice and permafrost, but it's there. It's got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's got nitrogen in the atmosphere. And if humans go to Mars and develop the craft of how to use these resources, then we can make Mars a place where human beings can sustain themselves. We can make a new world for our posterity. No species can expect to last long if it stays in the same place. In a very real sense, humans are not native to the Earth. We're not native to North America. We're not even native to Europe. We're native to Kenya. That's why we're tropical animals with long, thin arms, no fur. But humans were able to leave there and colonize the Earth by becoming creative. Man the inventor. That's how we coped with Ice Age Europe, and that's how we're going to cope with Mars and the planets beyond. In a remote part of Canada, Researchers have already been preparing for life as pioneers on Mars. Living in a space pod did prove difficult, but they coped. Zubrin is optimistic. We're ready to take this on, and frankly, if we shrink from this challenge, what it would really mean is that we have become much less than the kind of people we want, once were. Ignition sequence start. We are Six, much better prepared nine, today four, to send humans to Mars than we were to send people to the moon in 1961 when John F. Kennedy started the Apollo program. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And we were there eight years later. There is nothing in this that is beyond our technology. It's just a question of showing a little bit of moxie. For Zubrin, it's not the technology that's lacking, it's the will. But technology and willpower alone may not be enough. Just look at what we'd leave behind. This is our life support system. The plants that create oxygen, countless species of animal, 
How will we fare without them? Our survival depends on the living things we share our planet with. The air we breathe, the food we eat, all this is created by other forms of life. If Mars is to be our home, it'll have to be home to all of this as well. Fifteen years ago, we thought we knew the answer. This is Biosphere 2, a huge glass dome covering three acres of Arizona desert completely sealed off from the rest of the planet. The theory was that people could survive in it because the whole environment was self-sustaining. Trees would provide oxygen, artificial clouds and oceans would regulate the climate. But the experiment failed. Food rapidly ran short, extra air had to be pumped in. On Mars, that failure would have killed them all. If we're ever going to call the red planet our home, clearly something's going to have to change. And the easiest thing to change may be Mars itself. It's an idea called terraforming. The aim is to transform a whole planet from a place where we couldn't survive to one where we could. NASA scientist Chris McKay believes we could turn Mars into something surprisingly like Earth. When we think about going into space, we tend to focus on humans. But in fact, it turns out that it's easier for plants and microorganisms to go to Mars first. They're going to be the first Martians. In Death Valley in California, Chris McKay is seeking Earth's most hardy creatures. Stone. Creatures that might be able to survive on Mars. That's our guys. These green smears are algae, microscopic organisms that can thrive even in the harsh and variable climate of Death Valley. See the... And they could thrive on Mars too. Sucking in its thin and unbreathable atmosphere of carbon dioxide and pumping out oxygen in its place. Except at the moment, even the algae would find Mars deadly. The first step to make Mars habitable, habitable even for the toughest little algae, is to warm it up a bit. Right now, it's too cold and too dry for any type of life from Earth. Well, warming up a planet is something we know how to do. We're doing it on Earth. The pollution on Earth would be the medicine on Mars. It's a strange twist. The best way to make Mars a place we could live may be to pollute it. Here's how it would work. First, a spacecraft has to drop off the pollution-creating machines. suck up a mixture of Martian dust and atmosphere and process it into new chemicals. It then belches out these greenhouse gases to warm the planet and dark soot to soak up heat from the sun. If we send enough machines over time, Mars will warm up enough to allow these algae to survive. and the algae will begin to give Mars an atmosphere of oxygen. But to speed the process up, we would need more efficient oxygen makers. And the best that we know are plants and trees.
the real goal of making Mars breathable is to get trees growing there. Those trees, those will be the ones that make the habitable world. And then things will really start happening. As the oxygen level built up, insects, maybe small animals and eventually large animals and maybe even humans could then survive naturally. We could change Mars. If I were to lay out a time scale, I would say 50 years, humans go to Mars, and soon thereafter, the algae and the bacteria go to Mars. And then maybe 30 years later, the trees go to Mars. And then the humans come back, but this time in a natural setting that's biologically suitable for them. And then we've learned how to become a life form that lives on two planets, not just humans, but all of life. It's a bold and astonishing plan. If it works, we could turn Mars into a planet very much like Earth. But even Mars will not last forever. Even there, we could never escape the power of the sun. As the sun keeps getting hotter, the safe zone for life moves further and further out. This is Mars. Now Earth's dead, this is our home. Thanks to our terraforming, it looks a lot like Earth. And thanks to the hotter sun, it's now in a safe zone. The only trouble is, the sun is still getting hotter. Eventually, the safe zone will leave Mars behind as well. And with Mars dead, where next? Once again, human beings will be looking for a new home. And once again, we'll have to move further away from our brightening sun. But the planets further out are impossibly hostile worlds. Gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn are not places we could ever hope to transform. If we're going to survive on these alien worlds, it won't be the planets we'll have to change. We may have to change ourselves. David Brin is a science fiction writer. He imagines future worlds for a living. Well, it's a big universe out there, and the Earth is a very specialized environment. But we're not going to find many Earths out there. If we want to spread out into the galaxy, then we're going to have to adapt to the universe. Uh, it's not very easy for human beings to be, get accustomed to that idea because we're used to making the environment adapt to us. As the sun becomes hotter, new worlds will warm into life. This is Europa, one of Jupiter's huge moons. We know it today as a frozen planet, airless, with a crust of iron-hard ice. But in the future, it will be something else entirely. The ice will have melted. Europa will have become an ocean world. After Mars, perhaps we'll come here and make this our new home. We could live in cities at the bottom of an alien sea. But David Brin thinks that in the end, a life behind glass may not be the solution.
Now we're thinking of going to other planets. At first, we'll arrive in spacesuits, live in domes, bringing our earthly environment with us. But eventually, people will want to get out of those domes. And part of that will involve changing ourselves to fit into new environments. Our ancestors evolved for life on Earth. But Bryn thinks our descendants may redesign themselves for a future on other worlds. Human beings have been wonderfully inventive in the last 20 million years. And yet, other species have not been idle. Birds develop lungs, which the air flows through from one side to the other, so all of the lungs are used. We only use about half of our lung capacity. If we were to just genetically engineer ourselves so that our lungs flowed through like those of birds, think of the thin atmospheres that we could live in. Wouldn't it be great to be able to hibernate like a bear? We'd be able to travel to far planets, possibly even far stars. And if they live and work in zero gravity, eventually they're going to get sick and tired of pulling around a third of their weight in these useless legs, which are only good occasionally for pushing it against walls. Why have legs if you're in zero gravity when you could have two additional arms? Wouldn't it be more functional, jumping all over the place like gibbons? Can genetic engineering achieve any of these things? Who knows? We're just at the beginning of this grand adventure. But it's an extravagant version of tomorrow that we should be thinking about. Wouldn't it be a desirable thing? If they're happy, if they're creative, if they're productive, if they're part of a great civilization, Viva la différence. We can only guess at the future. What will our descendants be like? We'll have to wait and see. And where will they live? Because the only certainty is it cannot possibly be here. It's not just that the sun will have seared all life from planet Earth. It's that the planet itself will no longer exist. Everything we know will have disappeared. Because in the far future, our sun will turn into a monster. It's going to consume the solar system. Its first victim is the closest planet, Mercury. Next, Venus is transformed into a molten fireball. And ultimately, boiled away. And still the sun grows. It's 160 times its original size, 2,000 times hotter. And its next victim is the Earth. Long since seared barren by the sun, the place we once called home now melts and is engulfed. Seven billion years from now, the Earth will be gone. For us today, one question remains. Is the future of our planet also our future? Can we really survive the death of planet Earth? Look at where we stand today. Look at how far we've come. Compared to the world of 100 years ago, we're living in a science fiction universe with skyscrapers 100 stories tall. Who can believe, looking at that, that looking forward to the next 100 years, there will not be a 
new branch of human civilization on Mars. And look back a thousand years now. The world lit only by fire. Who can say that a thousand years from now, there will not be hundreds of new branches of human civilization filling out worlds on orbiting hundreds of stars in this neck of the galaxy? Some people think that we're living at the end of history, but I couldn't disagree more. I think we're living at the beginning of time, where present at the creation. It's a glorious time to live. For all we know, we might be the only life form in the galaxy and the universe. If that's true, I think that really deepens the importance of the role of humans in spreading life beyond the Earth. If we're the only spark of life, then we certainly don't want that spark to go out. Our scientists today are already imagining strange and far-off tomorrows for our kind. And if we do survive, perhaps we will be there to witness the moment when our sun's transformations finally end. It was first the giver of life, then the destroyer of worlds. And now, it too is doomed. This is the sun at the end of its life. Layer after layer, it is blowing itself apart. Huge clouds of star stuff drift out into space. It's a slow process, it takes millions of years. And what follows is inevitable, the death of our sun. It casts off one final layer, and its spark is extinguished forever. So the sun will one day go out. Will that be a significant event to our descendants billions of years hence? I don't think so. They will have observed similar phenomenon on innumerable other stars long before that time. But if they did think about it, they would note with gratitude that their ancestors did not stay on that one little world and await their doom, but rather spread forth into the universe and made their life possible. No one can know our future, but our son's future is certain. There will come a time when we must leave our Earth behind. Our planet will be gone. Our home will be in space. <laughs>